recording. So welcome everyone to this session on food as education. Um, I'd love to invite us to just arrive in this space, um, making sure you're comfortable, maybe adjusting how you're seated, reaching for something if it will add comfort for you. It's going to be a long day. You're here for other sessions as well. And maybe you've already been in some sessions. So who knows, maybe your body needs some uh, bit of movement, some bit of stretching. And then I'm going to invite you to just connect with a sense of something that you enjoy to eat. So a food item that you enjoy. And you might enjoy this food item through different parts of your body, maybe through touch, maybe through sight, maybe through taste, maybe through smell, maybe through texture. And just come into a sense of what that feels like for you in your body, imagining yourself encountering food in this way, just in this moment. This might be a memory. Maybe something else comes as you remember this, um, this food item in this moment. And just rest in the receiving. Food is such a place of encounter, of vulnerability, of power, of possibility. And also of the meet, a meeting place of our histories, our tangled histories. And so I'm just allowing yourself to welcome in all of that in this moment. I'm taking a deep breath in and deep breath out and coming back to the space. I'd love to invite our panelists today to introduce themselves. Um, and perhaps we'll go in order of um, just the letters of our first name. Um, I'd love to invite us to introduce ourselves, introduce ourselves, um, wanting to, you to share like how how have you encountered food and what is your relationship with food in this moment and food in particular as a site of learning and also share with us about a food item that is dear to you either dear to your tummy your heart your eyes your mind your spirit your body and tell us a little story about why um, I will go first my name is Ongoya Kamonji I'm sitting in Ongatarongai a town outside of Nairobi um, my encounters with food have often been through my background is, is actually, and I'm remembering to slow down for translation, my background is in ecology and environmental studies, um, and also in exploring food in particular, and all the ways in which food brings together politics, history, the body, gender, um, taste, enjoyment, pleasure, spirituality. And so for me, I've encountered food in particular as a mentor, as a guide, um, and, ha and food has been like a spiritual nexus in my life in particular, um, really evoking and inviting me on a decolonizing and re-indigenizing journey. Um, later on, food, I have encountered food through journalistic exercises. So um, speaking with indigenous women who are rematriating seed, indigenous seeds um, in different parts of Kenya. Um, and so bringing together mm -hmm. that experience of um, food and how it connects to history, but also how it can reimagine potential futures. A uh, food item I particularly really love is um, taro, which in for my people, we call it noma. And I just think it's such a beautiful food item um, with its flecks of purple through this like creamy white skin. And I just, it's so beautiful to look at it before it's cooked. Um, and it's also so beautiful when it's in my mouth and going to my belly. Um, and I love also connecting with all of the histories um, and the realities of taro, where it's grown and where it's revered, 
um, the places where tarot is very sacred um, and the places in my own culture where tarot is also um, such an important food item. Okay, with that introduction, I'd love to invite uh, Mama D. would you like to go next? Greetings, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, to be in your company. Uh, hmm. So I'm here in 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 uh, southeast England, in in Kent, just um, not so far from London. And um, my parents hail from the Caribbean, and before that, who knows exactly because the Caribbean has been quite a collecting bowl, predominantly of people of the African continent, but also other places. Uh, I, am, uh, I was trained in agriculture, formal agriculture, and then went to work in East and West Africa in food and found that I had to relearn cultivation and relationship with the earth and I think I've been just relearning ever since and some of what I learn I share um, in different ways um, because I feel that what I've been discovering has been so exciting and so interesting I've always just wanted to share <laughs> um, that which I've been learning from everybody who is an expert in some form or fashion uh, because everybody is nourished or becomes nourished or participates in things that grow. As you were speaking, Wangui, I was thinking this word food is really problematic for me increasingly. <laughs> Not only because we tend to think about food as just the thing that goes into our mouths. And I, I don't see uh, it as that. I see it as anything that comes to us that can nourish us. So the wind can be food, beautiful, beautiful music, can be food, good company, can be food. Um, so food is not really the one. It's kind of misleading, maybe. Um, so what do we talk about? Just I, I like to just use the word nourishment. And um, yeah, and so also when we are talking about things that go into our mouths, I, I feel that then we forget the other things that grow in the soil, you know, like the fibers, biofuels, you know, or all the other things that grow cotton that have complicated and complex histories. Um, but which also contribute to our, our nourishment. Um, I refer to myself as a plant whisperer. <laughs> I love plants and they're all over my house. You can see some here um, in all forms. I was speaking to a friend from a Korean friend to, this morning and describing the array of tropical plants in my bedroom, bananas, aloes, pineapples some are actually growing here in Kent like yay I've got two pineapples growing <laughs> by themselves and some are dying but I like sometimes to keep dying plants because I'm reminded of the whole cycle of life and you know a citrus in my room has sprouted a green stem and all the stems are looking dead so it's just amazing and it just connects me keeps me connected in terms of um a favorite food oh my goodness what to say <laughs> but I I thought I would name the mushroom I love mushroom smell like it smells so much of earth and for me mushrooms uh I like I like an unto myself because um mushrooms grow from a place that's dark and hidden <laughs> And then what they produce is an unusual fruiting body. You can never tell, you know, from this mass of mycelia or, or, or clumps of, um, you know, fungal uh, fruiting bodies below the soil. So that they yield all these unusual fruit. And the fruit are not only unusual in that, you know, some are poisonous, some are edible, but also... Um, some of them engage with your mind as well as your body. So that's just kind of amazing, I think, about mushrooms. Um, 
so they're special. And one of the unusual things for me that I discovered when I was working in West Africa was the extent to which village people used a whole variety of different mushrooms. And, and prior to that, I hadn't associated West Africa with mushrooms. And so it was quite a revelation. And even though I, I can't tell you names or anything right now about the specific species, I knew that we ate them very frequently. And I want to learn more about mushrooms. And I want to grow my own, not just toadstools in the back garden. <laughs> So I'm going to pass on to Crystal. <laughs> awesome. Happy greetings, everyone. I'm Crystal Foreman. I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland, USA. And um, I do a lot of things with food um, and I work with a lot of different people around food. So I am a plant-based educator. I'm a chef um, and I teach people how to grow food. I'm a Baltimore City Master Gardener. So as a volunteer, I teach people how to um, use like different seeds and plants that they have. Um, and I like to show people how to regrow food, like using food scraps as well. So um, you should cover everything. I am a permaculture designer. I do assist in teaching, like co-facilitating um, permaculture or indigenous um, practices. I um, Love to teach children how to grow food, harvest, preserve, um, and sell food at farmers markets as well. So I have um, a program where I actually work with um, homeschooled youth as well as summer camps, teaching them how to you know, get the seed in the ground, how to actually take care of the plants, um, how to transplant um, seedlings as well. Um, last year we planted um, trees, fruit and nut trees, um, and most of them have survived, so that's good. Um, because sometimes it's not a great success rate. Um, but like they're learning that some food you can receive quickly, like radishes, or some things take longer, like years, like the trees. And so they get to get connected and knowing that the food that they're growing is nourishing their communities, um, as well as future generations. Um I also am a produce safety educator. So I work with farms to make sure that they have food safety plans, that they are um, operating in safe methods, that they have everything they need um, you know, from SOPs to like, checklists, whatever they can possibly need to run their farm in a safe manner. Um, and then I also go to the farms to teach people how to use the produce. So sometimes we grow things that people aren't used to. Um, the picture that I um, shared with the conference is me holding a kohlrabi plant. And I have grew up cooking. I've been cooking since, um, you know, I was eight years old. My mom didn't particularly like cooking. She was a great cook, but she didn't like it. So she made sure her children knew how to cook. So I was cooking at a very young age um, and was used to all types of produce. And so when I got the kohlrabi, I was like, what is this? I was actually um, growing, volunteering on an urban farm in Baltimore City. And we were growing um, a lot of traditional things, you know, kale, collards, things that we were used to, but then we were also growing um, unusual things. And the kawabi sat in my refrigerator for a couple of weeks. And I knew that if I was having difficulty figuring out what to do with this, other people were too. So I um, started teaching um, our CSA, like we would give out recipes, but that wasn't enough. Like showing people how to use the food was very important. So I started teaching people how to use the produce, um, you know, that we were growing. And then um, more recently, it's become a thing of me showing people how to use the food in produce boxes. Um, during the um, pandemic and even now, we're, we've been giving away um, fresh produce and produce in um, boxes, CSA shares. And people are getting like winter squash and eggplant and other things that they haven't been used to um, cooking with. So I teach people how to actually cook the food in an easy, delicious, nutritious manner. And, um, you know, they get to see me actually make it. When I do it in person, they get to taste the food. So they get to know like, this is delicious. It didn't cost a lot of money. It's um, accessible to everyone. And um, then I hear reports of people coming back and telling me they made the dishes over and over. So I know that like, that's a good thing. Um, during the pandemic, I also started doing YouTube and um, 
Facebook videos. Before that, people were telling me to do it and I just wouldn't, I didn't want to turn the camera on. Um, but I've been going live almost every week um, since March of 2020. So I have lots of videos showing people how to use the winter squash. Um, last year, I spent like the whole winter showing people how to do different things with winter squash um, every single week. So I'm just teaching people, you know, how to use foods that they're familiar with in healthy ways, but also introducing people to new things and then reducing food waste. So um, teaching people how to use all of the plant, how to compost, how to, um, if you don't know something, how to look it up, how to um, share access with others and um, you know, just reducing food waste in general. Um, and I also do love showing people how to reuse food scraps. So, you know, um, the onions, the green onions or um, carrot tops or anything like that, like where they can actually get more food out of it, grow it in containers and showing people that they can grow even in an efficiency, like a small apartment, they can still grow food even if they don't have outdoor space. See, so a food that um, is dear to me is actually kale. There are over a hundred varieties of kale. Um, the farms here in Baltimore grow about eight different varieties. Um, my favorite two are lacinato kale, also known as dinosaur kale, and um, traditional curly kale that I grew up with. So um, lacinato kale is like, it's, the stem is like a little more tender. I feel like I can use all of it for like kale salads. And um, I started doing kale slaw for some of the people now and you know, smoky kale, different things like that. Um, and the curly kale, I love to teach kids because they love to take, take it upside down and take the stem and just, um, you know, take the leaves off. And it's just a fun activity for them to do. Um, so there's a lot of different things around kale. Um, for me, like making the smoky kale, because I am um, plant-based, I don't use any animal products. Coming up with a way that is familiar tasting for people was very important to me. Um, I grew up eating kale is you know, for Sunday dinner, for holiday gatherings. Um, my grandmothers would put like smoked meats in the um, kale and that wasn't necessarily the healthiest method. So I found a way to make it super delicious, remind me of my grandmother's um, kale and keep it cholesterol free as well. So um, whenever I eat it, it just reminds me of my family, of holidays, of New Year's all of those things um, that's associated with, um, you know, that nice smoky kale um, and, you know, teaching people that they don't have to cook it, overcook it as well. Although um, I have done a few times where I've cooked it for long times um, for events, just making sure that people like really get that feeling of um, love and, and home um, in their food. So yes, kale also, it's also very nutritious. Um, and you could put it in your smoothies, a lot of different things. I love kale. So yes, that's it um, for me. I'm going to pass it on to Nicole. Thank you, Crystal. Oh, this is one of those panels that I struggle to be on because I get so involved in listening to everyone else and hearing about their stories and their work, which was certainly my experience when we got together to prepare too. Mm, so who am I um, in all of this? My name is Nicole Savita. Um, I am I'm a food systems thinker, author, educator, and I have been for quite some time at the center of my career. Um, I right now am the vice president at a little tiny college in Northeastern Vermont called Sterling College, where we run um, our own farm and our own food system. Um, producing about half of what we consume on campus and really intentionally and relationally trying to source a lot of the rest. And there I, I also lead our EcoGather initiative, which is a collaborative online learning network um, that I talked about last night. And I have been teaching in a variety of spaces and in a variety of ways in the food system um, for probably about 10 years. I'm trained as a lawyer, which always surprises everybody. Um, it was not a great fit for me, but it was a really good way. Um, I, adversarialness and transactionality are like two of my, my biggest uh, enemies in the world. And so really odd fit for me, um, but something I didn't learn until after that process. But what that does is it really um, helps me situate food, which is so rich and embodied um, 
and the concepts of nourishment that Mama D were bringing forward in the larger set of systems and structures um, that create and recreate and reshape the world, many of which uh, either are in need of dismantling or are collapsing themselves now and creating opportunities to rebuild. So I've worked across education, law and policy, advocacies for um, agricultural and food worker justice and ethics, um, food ethics across a range of institutions of higher education and nonprofits. Um, I'm also, I guess I get to say this today, I'm also a published author. Um, it came by surprise last night that my book published a couple days early and today is in fact the day. So um, I have a book that came out today called Feeding Each Other, Shaping Change in Food Systems Through Relationship with my dear friend, uh, Michelle Auerbach. We wrote it together and weave story um, and relational paradigms into um, the work that gets done to try to shape change in food systems. And um, I'll put I'll put a little information about that in the chat. Writing that book has, was a real journey for me in um, thinking about how the human side of food, how it helps co-create our identity and our experience, our culture, the connections through our ancestry and lineage, um, and also our connections to the environment all come in in food and food construed broadly, of course. Um, and so really thinking about how when we take that and we kind of jam it into um, capitalistic, colonial, transactional frames, we're automatically malnourishing ourselves. Um, and so what everyone has spoken to so far um, is that move toward relationship um, and away from transaction and extraction in food. And that's really been a central piece um, of all of this for me. I was going to, I was going to talk about mushrooms initially, but Mama D did such a beautiful job of that that I will um, I will pick another of my among my favorites. My kids always ask me for my favorite anything, and I always say, I don't have favorites. I can't pick favorites. Um, I have so many kind of kin and companions. Um, but the other one that does hold a particularly special place in my heart, and when I was visiting the uh, seedlings and the chickens, little baby chicks in our basement this morning, I spent an extra moment with our tomato seedlings. Um, and tomatoes connect me deeply to my paternal grandmother, um, who I had the good, great fortune of living upstairs from um, in an in intergenerational household when, when I was, for, for much of my childhood, um, her name was Rose. This bracelet I have on was hers. And um, she and I used to grow tomatoes together in my grandfather's garden. Uh, we'd always plant a couple extra uh, because we knew I liked to go out there with her and pick them and my children do the same now. Um, I, I come of Irish and Italian descent. Um, and of course, while the tomatoes did not originate in Italy, um, by the time my grandmother um, was teaching me our food ways, they were an enormous part of uh, her diet and her traditions. And I just love, I love everything about them. I love their variety. I love the way that they pop in our mouths. I love how, um, oh, I love the smell of tomato plants. It is, that is something I do have a favorite. I have a favorite scent and it is the smell of tomato plants and their leaves. And, um, and so, and I love how it lingers on my fingers and I love, um, I love putting them up for the winter and being able to use them and keep that little bit of summer sunshine um, with me all winter long, which is a long winter here in Northern Vermont. Um, so it's an important, really important kin and friend for me. And Shruti, you asked to go last. So that I'm gonna help you get your wish here. Um, Let's turn it over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I, uh, my name is Shruti, Shruti Thariel. And right now I'm joining the call from a, a remote village in um, Megha, Eastern state of India. I'm, I'm basically from Kerala in India, but I'm traveling and I'm traveling for food, actually. <laughs> I am um, 
I am so yeah the place where I am at right now has very low network uh, so I'm actually standing under a tree where there's two bars of network on uh, um, uh, fortunately I'm able to join the zoom call so I'm keeping my video off so that I can speak and it does not get interrupted um, and like traveling for food uh, I am in the village and I'm here to document all the different kinds of uh, wild greens and wild, uh, wild vegetables that they fish from the forest. And, um, and my, my work has been around um, wild foods uh, and foraging for the last four or five years. I run a project called Forgotten Greens where I document research and uh, the dying tradition of consuming wild foods, uncultivated foods in India. Um, and um, yeah, and the whole process of Forgotten Greens has really helped me um, get in touch with my own uh, culinary heritage. Um, I, started, uh, I started documenting what my family ate, what my ancestors ate, um, and um, and yeah, and it, it has been a has been a very enriching journey. Um, so for me, food um, food is uh, identity. My you know, food is politics for me. I um, I think while growing up, there was a lot of shame around the food my community ate. And um, after growing up and after a lot of my work, I started um, I started working with that shame. You know, I started. Um, I started reclaiming my food, um, you know, being more comfortable around sharing that. So, like, my favorite foods is dried fish. Um, and I don't think I would have ever said this as a kid growing up, um, you know, because there was a lot of shame around eating dried fish. But um, today, I think um, I, I feel very proud about the fact that my community actually came up with this, like, most of the communities came up with this ingenious idea of drying meat so that they can eat it when they can't access which fresh food. And um, I come from a land where it rains for six months, heavy rains for six months. And for those six months, we have to, uh, we have to depend on dried, preserved, brined food. And we cannot go out and forage or uh, grow things. So, so yeah, so um, that has been my journey. Now I'm in the process of um, uh, reclaiming my food, my food identity. And also I feel uh, in the process, I want to create spaces for young people to do the same uh, in India. Um, and I'm, I'm in the process of um, creating a food studies center in India, which is contextual for people, uh, for Indians, so that we don't have to pay, you know, in euros and go to Italy and study about food. We can do it in India itself. Um, so, so that's my, uh, that's my journey. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Shruti. And I love how you've invited us to consider this, this, the place where food actually can, um, bring us in touch with pain yeah so shame around food and shaming around food um, and i'd love to invite our panelists to share about um, how the context that you are in the context that you find yourself in both the socio-political the historical but also the context in terms of land what the land is doing where you are how that is both inviting um, yourself and how you are then in turn inviting others to wean ourselves um, of the transactional, the extractive mode of being, um, as well as the ways in which that context is also challenging, that initiative, that intention, um, that move towards a more relational way of being. And this I'll leave open if somebody is, is wanting to jump in first. Welcome. Well, I'll go. So I am in the United States um, and with, we have a long um, 
history of, you know, um, enslaved folks having to work the land. And so the, like current generations, um, and I would say even the generations just before me, there was a lot of resistance to being on the land. There's a lot of resistance to wanting to grow food. Everyone wanted to have more industrial jobs or office jobs, um, things like that, and um, get away from the land because it was a negative um, thought process with that. So with me working with a lot of youth and working with um, people, you know, throughout in, in the urban setting, but I also do go to rural areas, but specifically working with the youth, when they see people who look like me out there, um, you know, hands in the soil, they are more intrigued and want to do it themselves. Um, there has, with urban farming, when it first really started taking hold here, there it was a mostly um, young white people who didn't have to do it. Um, you know, they could afford to go to the store and buy whatever they wanted to. It wasn't like they were growing food because they needed to. Um, it was, you know, something fun to do. Um, and unfortunately with that, some people, you know, they're young for a little while, you know, we're all young for a little while, and then you kind of outgrow whatever that is. And so they, some farms are left abandoned, not being taken care of. And it's usually um, the Black women who come in and like, take care of all of those things. And with that, they bring their young people. It's very important um, know when you have a, such a history that is considered um, negative now like being in land like that we have that positive and I think that that's happening pretty quickly um, there are a lot of young people who are getting back to the land who want to get back to the land and um, there's a lot of training opportunities specifically for youth um, in a lot of the urban areas not just Baltimore I'm seeing it in Detroit and DC and New York and different cities within California that um, youth are getting back to the land. They want to know how to grow their food. They want to have land sovereignty. They want to have sovereignty over their food that they um, grow. They want to know what's in it. Um, and um, just have that full control from like seed to table. Um, like I said earlier, teaching them how to like not only grow that food, but sell it. Um, how you can make a business around food, um, whether it's as a chef, you know, doing catering, um, having your own restaurant, or you're um, making value-added foods and creating your own jams and you know, tea um, blends, um, making skincare products from the things that are grown. So they're learning different business opportunities and seeing it as a way of independence, of um, you know, empowerment for themselves, empowerment for their communities, empowerment for future generations. And so taking that, um, that context that was something else and saying like, you know, hold on to whatever land that you do still have available in families and um, find someone who loves the land, who wants to get, there's always someone <laughs> in, in every generation, there's always someone who really does want, they, they want that opportunity to be connected to the land um, and adding that spiritual context in as well and letting them know that you no, know, People were brought um, to the Americas from but mostly West Africa because they were experts. They, you know, they were, they knew agriculture. It was in their um, bones, it was in their spirit. They just, they were connected to the land. And so no matter where they landed on this planet, they could connect to the earth and connect to the land and grow the food. And so it wasn't just like labor, it was that intellectual knowledge that, um, you know, helped this country become, you know, have the riches that it has. Um, and it was from that knowledge, you know, I talk about like the, what's known as California rice here or golden rice. It was the women um, from West Africa who brought that knowledge here to grow, you know, rice and make, you know, this industry what it was. And once slavery ended, the rice industry also went down um, because of that knowledge, you know, and so, and because people did not want to be free labor anymore. So all of that knowledge kind of went away too. And people didn't, others didn't take the opportunity to learn. And so I just want, you know, with that history, that negativity, um, like making that a positive, you know, why were we brought here in the first place? 
and why um, we should still be connected to the land, why we should have that land sovereignty um, and food sovereignty and how to make that possible for them and providing avenues and education for them to be able to do so um, a lot easier than um, others have had it. That's, um, thank you for that, Crystal. Okay. Um, that's, that's really interesting because in a way, I suppose we, we share that heritage, okay? Um, but here in the UK, the situation is quite different because I think I know of two black farmers, they're celebrated in the UK because there are only two of them, <laughs> right? And they rent um, their properties on which they grow. And so what, what I'm saying really is, is about disconnection. Um, when enslavement happened, one of the principal things that happened, it feels to me, was that people were, the la la what is referred to as land or earth space was, was torn away from the people because we are parts of the earth, all of us, wherever we are we're in continuity you know like I, I think we were saying in the preparatory session you know 57 percent of our cellular material is not genetically us it's microbiota that lives in us and so you know we're more earth than we are human <laughs> yeah and um so to be ripped from the earth is a very traumatizing thing and um the work that um, people who were so treated were uh, subject to wasn't really a reconnection unless they engaged in um, escape and marronage as it's called, yeah, and became maroons. And so uh, that was a, a toxic relationship, but even so, yeah, as, as you've said, Crystal, people pursued with their knowledge and with seeds and, and this kind of thing that was um, brought with them. But here in the UK, there was a total, uh, another cut made, yeah, because we came here not as uh, farm laborers, although I heard that during lockdown, people were recruited from Barbados to come and work on, on farms in England. I was, thought that was pretty crazy right but um yeah by and large um you know even though my my grandmothers and my mother's fathers and their peers used to always cultivate gardens such was their uh, attachment to having a certain amount of autonomy or sovereignty over what was going to be eaten um with you know no uh ownership relationship with the earth here um, and it being removed by 5,000 kilometers or more it meant that that continuity isn't there so for me with the, the work I was doing it was wanting the, the people who were in that position and other people such as you know the the underclasses and the working classes or, or that you know I was living amongst or encountering to reconnect with the idea of their connection to the earth and their sovereignty their autonomy their um their ability to have a relationship with with earth space and thinking again about how I was talking about what nourishment is that meant really a connection towards anything that was living yeah anything that had the ability to um for one to grow from so substrate was was kind of any any and everything that coloniality was removing our connection from and increasingly doing so so um after coming um, back from working in, in West Africa and working in food sovereignty and food justice um, arenas, I felt there were so many contradictions um, that it seemed as if there were a class of people who were well connected, well healed and able to access community food growing projects, urban food growing projects. And there was a large majority <laughs> who were just still marked as consumers you know, as if everybody didn't eat, as if everybody doesn't consume. 
Um, and I felt it was so important to draw attention to these um, contradictions all the more to help people feel empowered in the discourses that were taking place. So there would be discussions about um, food miles, for example, but people would have them over coffee and tea and eating chocolate biscuits. And I'm thinking, hold on, you know, you're talking about food miles, but so, um, you know, the, there wasn't necessarily a, a, very, a lot of lucidity around the um, histories, uh, complex and intertwined histories around how we become nourished. And, it, you know, it, it's just not sufficient to be able to have access to organic food. My parents grew up with food that wasn't named organic, <laughs> but it was much more widespread. Um, but now we have organic food, which only a certain set of people can afford. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of the idea of grief, injustice and, and all of these kinds of things, they arise very frequently and more and more the case as um yeah access to substrate if you like a place where one can feel one's connection with the earth um is lessening in all kinds of very more subtle ways um i feel so i think there is something to extend the conversation um beyond you know what we take in and to let people who perhaps will never um, in their lifetimes or even their children's lifetimes necessarily have access in the UK in particular. Maybe it's not so much the case in the rest of Europe, um, but will have less access to be able to actually um, grow things. Although I do encourage, you know, people to be able to do that even on balconies, even on window ledges, as, as, as I do, although I have a, you know, a pocket of a garden, much of my growing is taking place in other people's spaces, um, from scraps as you do, um, Crystal, and all of these kinds of ways, and to recognize you can grow produce from home right here, especially with global warming, <laughs> you know, these things are more possible. Um, but also to feel um, connections between themselves, yeah? Connections um, with the word, which is the place from which things grow as well, be it song, you know, be it creative writing, be it critical writing, um, which links to education. I home educated my children um, because I felt so strongly that Sovereignty had to be something that crosses, um, you know, it was, it's not just about food, it's, it's about how the, the possibility of autonomous connection with life in all of the different ways and with knowing and, you know, learning from the different cultures I lived amongst about principles such as um, Ubuntu, which is about interdependence and how that can be practiced in, in reality um, about intercultural learning um, and what one can gain from that to take one, to help one to live a good life. Um, I think the saying is that a person is only a, a proper person, a true person through other people. So relationship, interrelationship is is so important and in Yoruba they have a, a term Iwapele which is good character which is also about interdependency about the the quality of life that is lived at every different way every different level of of how we live so um, you know learning about food has also taught me that how reliant we are upon each other and each other doesn't only limit our, you know, the conversation is not only limited to the human, but to all living beings, you know, um, we are all connected. Um, and, you know, as a, as a coming from a lineage of people who were so, you know, dispossessed, it was so important to repossess um, those qualities that named and identified these connections these uh you know genuine connections with with everybody else um and everything else so that 
we are able to embrace our more than humanness and the power it holds um, to give and to receive nourishment as a logic of how we live on earth. And so um, all learning, therefore, was it's important to do learning in a way that recognizes that everything has the power to teach every you know thing that we encounter um and we and that's how we're you know continuously connected taking a pause to see if anybody else wanted to jump in but i would just pick up and i i think i may now be somewhere um further afield from the original question, but I'm gonna follow the thread of conversation. Um, there was so much in there in all of that, but the, the where you started to go towards the end, um, picking up on feeding each other, which is clearly an important concept to me and how that means more than just feeding humans, how that is we um, really feed our interspecies interconnectedness, interdependencies, how we form real kinships with the other forms of life that share this planet with us. Um, and I think that when I first started food as education, which is to say that I first started to, you know, teach agriculture and food law and policy or develop sustainable food systems programs at universities, um, everyone wanted me to teach classes about global food security and feeding the world. And, um, and I felt this pressure to really try to understand all of that. Um, and, you know, that I had to teach students, um, like, yes, we could talk about growing food, we could talk about um, supply chains, we could talk about food traditions and intersect all of those things in these interesting ways. But there was this sense in a lot of the mainstream programs where I began my work that if I if I wasn't teaching people to really understand how we and examine who that we is um, were going about feeding the world this giant project that I was somehow failing them and so um, the feedback I would get whether it was from colleagues or or from students was like you have to teach us how to use FAO stat which is the food and agriculture organization of the United Nations set of data about food flows around the world and you know international trade and all of this and I'm certainly not saying that that's not important because it is right and because in fact what we see in there is the evidence and of, of um extraction and reappropriation and you can also use it in, in many ways to understand um, patterns of coloniality and and over accumulation and hoarding and you can also figure out you can, it's, it's a trove of information but it's also not necessarily the language food wants to speak um, it is definitely not the language of nourishment it is definitely the language of sort of quantified appropriation. And I, I think that I really always felt somehow that I was just not skilled, educated, smart enough to figure all of that out and make sense of it and teach it. And, and clearly this must be what we should focus on. I think, you know, you build confidence as an educator and then you realize that actually often your instincts are telling you more than some of the external critique. And I threw off the shame about that and started focusing on what I understood needed to be in food systems education and in food spaces. And it was so much stuff that wasn't about food at all. <laughs> um, and so... I think one of the things that I, I feel most excited by um, is actually sort of breaking some, we think about food and food systems and I keep using plural because it's not just one, right? They're all nested and interconnected and, and I don't wanna be totalizing about it. Um, even though that that's broad and interdisciplinary and wide, right? Like once we think about everything from 
seed knowledge through agriculture, through um, other than agricultural food ways of foraging and hunting and pastoralism into what happens with processing and supply chains and trade and policy and labor and all of the things we do to then um, prepare food and the culture around it and then what happens afterwards and animals and their welfare and climate and environment like I'm talking about a subject that's really really big and that touches everything and I guess I'm also saying it needs to be bigger <laughs> um, we need to keep thinking about all of the other ways that we can center our focus so it's super important work um, to teach people how to grow food and how to grow food in ways that restore and regenerate. And it is super important work to teach people how to eat kohlrabi and enjoy it and how to regrow from scraps. So these are all really important. And it's really important to teach people um, how to see beyond the systems and structures that we're in and how to unpack the sort of deep histories of how we got here. And it's really important to sit down and smell your tomato plants and, in, and enjoy it and find the pleasure and the embodiment. Um, and I think we all find our own balances in, in that um, and the center of gravity in our work in that. Um, and that's actually what makes food as education so interesting and such a, a powerful way in and place in for me. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hello. Yeah. And uh, yeah, th that was really powerful. Um, and as I was listening to Mama D and Nicole, uh, something that I wanted to share uh, um, from my context, from India's context is, um, so we in India, we, we have layers of colonialism, according to me, my understanding. One is, the the British colonialism that happened, and then we have a widespread caste colonialism that not a lot of people talk about or are uncomfortable to talk about, uh, and and the last one is the current colonialism that's happening through market, and um, we are constant through our education system also where we are constantly being told to aspire, you know, to aspire to be like the West, to look at the West and to do, to, to do what the West is doing. Um, and, and these three, <laughs> they are so intersectional that, you know, there's no black or white. And when we talk up, so we do have the organic movement in India, which I think is really important. But again, you know, the idea of organic is something that's fresh, some Uh, I like in my perspective, it is run by um, a very majority um, um, a majority of uh, the upper mm, Shruti, I think we are losing you a little the bit. Food of those who do sorry. You um, could just go again. Am I audible? Just start over again. Now? Mm -hmm. Oh, start over again. <laughs> oh, not the whole thing, just, okay. you know, your last thought. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I was just saying that the, the larger food movement in India does not talk about, the, we talk about organic food. We talk about that's food that's, you know, local, but we still don't talk about food that, uh, that uh, people eat who, like, who don't have access to land. Uh, we don't talk about uh, food that is being foraged on a daily basis because people have to, you know, people have to live off that. They cannot be, because they don't have access. They don't, growing food was never, um, never a possibility for them. And, and I think um, for me, food, when we education, those are the answers that need to come out. Like how do we bring out um, how does the education system talk about these, or whatever the, the contextual education system talk about these nuances, talk about these uncomfortable 
conversations you know we how do we bring these uncomfortable conversations that that's not always uh, fresh green vegetables or fresh colorful fruits but is dried meat or is um, brined pickles that people have to eat and um and and like nicole said food is all of that food um food is um yeah food is beyond just land and um land and growing food food is also um i'm just repeating like the air we breathe and um yeah so it is beyond just these structures that are explicit to our eyes Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, I think one of the things I want to also bring in from my context is that actually for me, food was the was the first place that kind of invited me to confront the reality of the wounds of colonialism in my own context. Um, and it started off or like, you know, what I talked about in the beginning, tarot. I love tarot. Um, and I was studying outside of my country and I was struggling to find taro. I was missing <laughs> um, the foods that I was used to as one does when you're not at home. And in my search for taro, um, first of all, we didn't call it taro. So I had to learn what other people called this thing that this food that was so known to me in a certain way. Um, and in that search, I came into contact with, oh, other people also cook this food. Um, other people also eat this plant and they do that in different ways. Um, and that surprised me and it brought me in touch with, in confrontation with really, what I began to think of from that point as a cultural frozenness. That what had happened in the impact of colonialism in my context had been um, and for those who are you know, unfamiliar um, where I sit, this was a settler colony of the British, um, though it's not often recognized when people count the settler colonies of the world. Um, and I think settler colonialism does something very particular to the psyche of both the people and the land. Um, and so I began to confront what I began to think of as um, uh, this, cultural frozenness where we, I and I was seeing it in particular with food, that we only knew how to interact with this food in only one way. You know, you boil the taro and you eat it in the morning with tea. Um, and I was like, oh, but other people do so many different things. And so I was beginning to confront the the stoppage or the blocking of the continued innovation, the continued engagement in a free flowing, um, life supportive way between people and their place, between people and their lands, between people and their foods, between people and whatever imaginations might come into their, into their, into their beings to try out with something. And, and then began to see that and trace that, you know, starting with food, but through uh, um, all other kind of spheres of life, um, this idea of this cultural frozenness. Um, and I see it still also in, you know, Shruti was bringing in shame. Um, I have a family member who's often referred to like wild greens as weeds and completely refused to eat them. And to this day, okay, now he eats them but he will still call them weeds. And that is still a perspective that people hold around me um, or the perspective that like taro um, and sweet potatoes are old people's food um, be, or, or like they're foods that people only begin to eat once they've been diagnosed with sicknesses, with diseases, um, chronic ones. And so in these two ways, like I can see the challenges in my context to um, an open engagement with food. And just one other thing I would love to also mention is that often when we begin to talk about food, people just think farms. Um, and in one of my lineages, I come from pastoral people. And so nomadic pastoralism and actually deep 
um, engagement and deep interaction, deep relationship with animals is also a dimension of food um, that weaves in, you know, like to, to my people, um, the Maasai, like the cow is, is a sacred being, um, not sacred in the sense of like, you don't touch it, but it's sacred in the sense of like, all of our relationships, spiritual, cultural, um, are kind of negotiated or flow through and in conversation in relationship with the cow. Um, we pray with milk, for example, um, to ancestors and while honoring ancestors. And, you know, similarly, like the ways in which foragers are looked down upon, foragers and pastoralists all over the world are really looked down upon. And yet they also contribute to producing food. Um, and so these are like some of the, the kind of extractive transactional, the, the wounds that have come through um, colonial systems of engaging with food that are alive in my context. At the same time though, I really am alive to the invitation, which is the invitation that food made to me to confront that frozenness, to allow myself to be held um, by food while I sit with that frozenness. And while I allow, I begin to allow like that melting of the frozenness. And of course, as it begins to melt, that's grief, that's tears. Um, and, and so I'm also really alive to that invitation of how food can also be this repair, this reparative relationship if we can slow down to sense, if we can um, engage, especially for me with the potentials of indigenous foods um, to allow our nervous systems to be rewired, to allow ourselves to simply be held in belonging um, and food really as this place that can reconnect us to a sense of deep belonging to land. Um, as Crystal, you were speaking, I was thinking of this um, line that, well, that Leah Penniman um, often shares. Um, and she says like, the, la the land was the site of the crime, not the perpetrator. And in my context where, you know, on like all of my lineages, my people have experienced displacement from land um, through settler colonialism. And so, there can be this sense of like feeling removed, feeling like wounded by the land itself. Like, why didn't you stand up for me? Or like, why didn't you show up for me or protect me? And so there's this invitation that I see also in food to slow down, to actually be held in a container that's large enough that can allow us to recalibrate to the land was a site um, and actually also a victim of, of wounding from colonialism um, and other oppressions and, and not the perpetrator. And to allow food to rewire both our physical, our bodily nervous system, as well as, as our spiritual um, systems, as well as actually to repair our souls, to repair our spirits. Um, with that, I would love to, to inquire from you and also welcome in through the chat, any questions that people have. Um, I'm curious what's landing for you, what's stirring, what's bubbling. Um, um, what's, what's simmering maybe uh, from all that has been shared and also just through this process of sharing we are talking about food we're not like directly engaging with food in this moment but this is also a, a site of learning a site of food inviting us into learning and relearning um, I'd love to invite just final considerations from our panel about this reimagining journey this invitation into a different way of being it isn't easy um, I find that the pool of dominant and extractive ways is very seductive, very strong. And so I'd love to invite you all to just share um, how you keep yourself sober along this path. Wengui, there was something you were saying in there and I was writing down bits and pieces that I think actually fits with this closing question you posed. Um, I kept hearing about how 
thinking about as you were talking about how de dematerialized many of the ways, at least um, in my experience in the US and, and with young people who are spending a ton of time interacting with food on, and food culture, food ways through social media, how dematerialized food has gotten and how that's another layer on top of the disconnection of food being commoditized and moving through supply chains. And I was thinking a bit too about how like, you know, there's this thing now where TikTok makes a recipe super viral and famous and suddenly everyone's trying to do the thing with the tomatoes and the feta cheese and the pasta or whatever the next thing is, right? And, and I'm not in those spaces, but I, I see enough of them through other people to realize that there is there's this complex thing happening where both our attention is being mined through algorithmic advertising driven um, platforms and that it's changing the way in which people are actually learning about food and exchanging food ways. So I love nothing more than getting to learn about the foods of another culture, but I like doing that from someone who is interested in sharing that with me. And, and that is often what is happening, right? There are often very real, there are absolutely very real people behind much of this using this new tool to share in those ways. Um, but then they're often doing it in ways that are designed to like win the algorithm, win the game, and it's pulling everything out of its context. Um, and, it's and so it's, we've broken the food from the land, we've broken the people from the land, and, and we've broken these food ways. And now we're, we're consuming each other's food ways in these really, really voracious, decontextualized, dematerialized ways. And I, all of that sort of landed for me as I was listening to you speak about something related, but, um, but also in its own context. And it made me realize that that's actually where a lot of my grief sits right now because um, where I find the balm, the hope, the sobering is in the material connections with food. It is in watching my husband learn how to cultivate um, mushrooms, right? And building a relationship with the mycorrhizae through all of the stages. It is, it's the cycles, the more than four seasonal cycles of being with the land um, as the things that will nourish us move through the cycles of their nourishment. And, and so I think the thing that makes me most, gives me the most grounded hope is that so many more people are starting to realize amidst all this noise and the overculture um, that the real education is in those material, experiential, interpersonal moments of relationship and exchange, and really just trying to not lose sight of the substantiveness of all of that, to let it be held. Um, I used to, back at the beginning of my journey, refer to food, differentiate food from other parts of trade as the most intimate commodity, right? And now I would take the word commodity out of that because I don't want to also commoditize food, but it is intimate in that we become, we become, we remake ourselves from what we eat in the, in the physical, a substantial sense. And so resisting, yeah, resisting that abstraction feels really, really grounding and important to me. Yeah, that's such an important uh, thing to say, to resist the abstraction, to move towards a re-embodiment, yeah? And how difficult that is in global societies all merging into totalized realities, such as the ones you've described um, of social media and um, the universalization of an idea, a set of particular ideas about what food is and how we can continue to consume it. As if the sources, you know, I, I, I think my focus is on histories and sources and origins. 
and not getting swept up in what I refer to as colonial time, which is one way of thinking about ourselves here in time space, you know, uh, on earth, um, to use the more than human references, use many more than, hum more than human references to think about ourselves um, or to think about humans on earth. I, I, I had to separate that there because I'm increasingly feeling myself wanting to define myself as not human, as human as being this product of the en of enlightenment thinking, of human as being the product of um, global capitalism um, in, in its ascendancy and moving ever further away from embodiment and into cyberspace, into um, you know, quantum thinking and becoming more and more disembodied, right? So if we were to um, think about narratives of the more than human, of the perspective from rocks and mountains and hills, or something as simple as the grass, you know, when we mow the grass or when um, animals are eating the grass, it grows back repeatedly, you know, and so is actually quite old, even though it just looks very humble there, something that we can walk upon, but it grows from its center, which is something that is teaching, which is why I said earlier on about everything having the capacity to teach, because there is so much to learn from the perspective of the more than human. And it you know, may not be grass's own perspective, but grass grows from the center and enables, that is what enables it to continue. And maybe we can think about what does that mean for us as, as beings? Uh, we're not homo sapiens because we're not wise, <laughs> right? So I don't know, we, we probably need a renaming, um, you know, put some, put some suggestions in the chat. <laughs> but, um, you know, trees, um, how they grow. I think I, I gave this example. I mean, we the soil is a living being and um, trees who are like have been on earth, you know, three billion years, we ourselves have only been around 300,000. So we've got so much to learn from these elders, right? And they've decided um, that to, to be rooted in this matrix of rich living being called soil, yeah, while we walk around hurriedly on top of it. <laughs> Who's better off? I mean, uh, for humans who, you know, we are the, the come latelys, we think that um, trees don't move, but how can we tell? We haven't been around long enough to know <laughs> on the tree scale of things, whether they move or not, <laughs> really, right? Um, we're so definitive, we're so categorizing. We, we, we name, we see the superficial and we think we know. <laughs> but we have got so much to learn, you know? So, you know, whilst we're here embracing AI um, increasingly at an accelerating rate, but we, the simplest things of the body, of embodiment, we know so little, yeah? Um, you know, the, the macrocosm, microcosm um, wisdom of, you know, of anciency is something that we could return to. But how are we going to do that unless we slow down? So I know that there is the slow food system and the slow whatever system, but slow learning certainly has <laughs> much to say for it in relation to this idea about how we nourish our minds and it's not at speed. <laughs> we, we nourish our minds and our bodies slowly. You know, I'm sure we've all grown up, you know, with parents telling us not to gobble our food down and not to rush it. Um, why would we want to do that with the nourishment of our minds? I'm reminded of, uh, and, and this is, the things that keep me sober, I go back to, yes, um, you know, being able to slowly think about the wisdom from other beings, the more than human on the planet. But also we've had stories, um, stories old um, and some new, 
that offer a lot of wisdom too. And I think of the children's story about chicken licking. I think I mentioned this. I don't know how many of you are old enough to know of that, that particular tale. Um, chicken licking was sitting in his in the farmyard and an acorn dropped on his head, but he thought the sky was falling down. And so he he thought he needed to go and tell the king that the sky was falling down. And on the way, he met Turkey Lurkey, Goosey Lucy, Ducky Lucky, and all kinds of other creatures. Um, and he told them, you know, they asked him, why, where was he going in such a hurry? And he said, I'm on the way, the sky is falling. I'm on the way to tell the king. But he met Foxy Loxy and Foxy Loxy was <laughs> seemingly the only wise character there, <laughs> recognized what was going on and invited uh, Chicken Lickin to, you know, hop on his nose because he'd tell him, take him to the king. And of course, Foxy Loxy consumed him. Now, is that where we're heading in our hurry? Where are we going? When we came onto this earth, did any one of us sign a contract to say we needed to rush through our years at high speed on somebody else's agenda without making relationship to everything we encountered around us? Is our life not about growth, not the economic um, growth, which is really not possible, but growth that comes from working with the dynamic, this continuous dynamic, which is the pluriverse, yeah? The multiple worlds that we have everything to learn from. And to do so, we have to be slow. So I don't want to follow that. <laughs> I felt like that was a great, <laughs> great, um summary in closing there, um, but I will answer the question briefly. Um, so I am a business owner. I'm also on boards of um, different nonprofits. As a business owner, I am in a position where I am being told by, you know, different people, different business coaches that I have to be on social media. Um, and in reality, like if you almost don't have a business, if people don't see you on social media, um, you can have a website, you can have all of those things, but you have to be seen. And it's definitely um, a strong pull there. For me, it's not as seductive <laughs> as it is maybe for others, but there is that pull, like, you know, when I post even like food videos, is anyone watching them? Like, is it worth it for me to do? I don't need millions of views. I just want to know that people are getting information from them and that they're beneficial. Um one of the ways I can keep myself grounded and I do keep myself grounded with that is going into the community. Most of my work is actually going um, into the different you know, community centers, places of worship, schools, um, you know, different programs and engaging with the people and, you know, getting them to try the food and taste it and seeing the reactions. Um, when I work with my seniors, they're definitely very honest about everything, which I love. Um, so I get to like try different things with them. Um, and you know, and then I can, you know, bring that to everyone else. And really working in the soil with the youth, um, that helps keep me sober, that helps keep me grounded, that helps me stay on mission, on um, vision, and knowing, um, you know, the impact I'm making is going to affect them directly. They take what they learn back home to their families um, and to their future families as well. So it's something that's like, in them at a younger age, that they can, um, you know, continue to to grow themselves, and teach their families, um, and teach you know, future generations, teach their friends and um, others who might not be able to attend the classes, but they can show, still share that information with others. So that keeps me going. It keeps me sober. It keeps me um, totally grounded in what I'm doing and um, motivated. Because sometimes it does get little um, tiresome and you know it's definitely important to have community and I do try to like surround myself with a community of like-minded folks but it's, it's a lot of work um, if you think of it like I, I, I don't see it like I feel like this week has been a lot because um, I've been and I'm grateful because there's been a lot of people wanting the information I've been doing like 
you know, two, three classes a day, which is a little more than what I like to do. Um, but also see that that means that there's a need, there's a desire, and then there's a need for more people to do what I'm doing um, and getting out there and sharing the information and giving people the opportunity to see how it's done and actually taste the food. Because if I can make, you know, two dishes in less than an hour, you know, and I'm talking and doing all these other things too, then they know that they can go home and do the same thing in less than an hour and feed their family a delicious meal. Um, and when people come back and tell me that they're actually doing it, that definitely helps keep me motivated and um, grounded as well. Yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you all. And I see that Shruti had to step out. Um, I will just quickly respond and then maybe I'll ask Sophia um, if you would come on um, in a little bit to share if there's any questions from the chat um, and we can have maybe like 10 minutes to respond. Um, for myself, I think what I would love to add is, is, you know, I use the word seductive and strong and actually I'm, I'm feeling called to use the word sticky. I feel like dominant systems are very sticky. Um, and what keeps me sober is the moments when I'm actually courageous enough to rest in not knowing, when I'm courageous enough to slow down, and when I'm courageous enough to actually name the difficulties and tell the truth. I feel like my experience has been that we're often so afraid to just simply admit the truth of what is, um, the truth of not knowing, the truth of actually this is very difficult right now, the truth of actually I'm really feeling pulled to not, you know, um, eat the meal before me um, in, uh, in presence and not hold this moment in presence. I'm actually really pulled to pull up Netflix. I'm actually really pulled to not care, you know, where the food has come from. I'm actually really pulled to who cares, you know, like effort. <laughs> um, and I feel like it, it's really courageous to admit, to tell the truth and admit the difficulty um, and to ask for help. And one of the most beautiful places that I know to actually admit the difficulty, tell the truth and ask for help is when I am face to face with food. Um, and when I say this right here is very difficult and, and you know, this is what um, I also want to think of as new prayers, like the new prayers that my relationship with food is bubbling through me. Um, the new prayers that can actually allow for the melting of that grief that has been so stuck and so frozen for generations. Um, yeah, I feel like, <laughs> and um, I, I would include poetry in new prayers, but this is like one of the places for me that allow me to get a little bit unstuck from the stickiness of dominant extractive ways or, or just dominant wounded ways, if I may call it, if I may, you know, phrase it that way as well. Um, and to receive the help. And that help often looks like grief. It often looks like, um, I remember one day I had a whole meal just crying with the food. Um, <laughs> Not because I was in pain, but because I was I was actually deeply processing all of the things that are asking to be processed, both in my body's history as well as in all of the generations of history that have um, been lived in 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 my history in my past that are yet to be processed, that are yet to be held in care and yet to be witnessed. Um, in a loving space and in a space that will honor them. And I, I think that food is a beautiful blessing for all of that. Okay, so I'll take a breath and then invite Sophia. Yeah, there weren't um, any questions that I saw in the chat, but there were lots and lots and lots of beautiful comments. Um, and I would love to invite everyone because we are at time for this session, but Rec 3.0 has a Mighty Networks um, community. So, so
please, please, please head over there and you're welcome to share your curiosities or anything else that has been harvested from this session or other sessions in that community there. All are welcome. And I'm super excited to see the food as education um, conversation continue to flourish there. Um, unless okay. anyone in the participants wants to come off and ask one last question, um, I, I will leave you all with your last final closing thoughts or how, however you would like to um, adjourn <laughs> and say goodbye today. Yeah. If there's one person maybe would like to ask a question, um, I can hold space for that before I invite us into a closing. And you could do that by I ideally like raise your digital hand um, so that it like brings it to the front. Okay, I see Mel. I don't have a question, sorry. I just have, I just, um, you know, I just wanted to share something that's really inspired me and, and transformed my life. Um, and, and it's, and it's very directly, um, uh, interwoven with food. Um, I go on Pindapada. I don't know if anyone knows what Pindapada is, but it's a, it's arms. I go on arms. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I guess it, it's interesting how you can, you can forget the gift of things, can't you? Um, and 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 um, uh, yeah. I I've just um, witnessing um, uh, witnessing that generosity, but also um, yeah, there's so there's probably so much to it. Um, the interdependence as well. Um, and um the kind of humility in, as you said, uh, um, asking for help, just going out, um, there, uh, with nothing and, 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 um, and, uh, 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 surrendering to, um, uh, that, um, faith in, in, in the, 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 the recognition that, that, uh, we all, we all need nourish, nourishing, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a, a gift. <laughs> Thank you. Well, maybe you could um, drop the link to that in the chat for people who are unfamiliar or material for that. Um, and yeah, just in closing, I would love to invite us to come back to our bodies. Um, food and ourselves and land, all of these are bodies. Um, and notice, like I had asked earlier, what is bubbling, what is simmering, what has been added to your plate, what is awakened, what will you flow into the rest of your day with? after this conversation and whatever that may be to you or for you it may be more than one thing I invite you to like allow just even one thing to just really deeply penetrate saturate allow your cells to open up and receive the nourishment of that allow it to percolate in whichever systems of, our, of your body it needs to percolate in. Maybe invite some movement as that percolation moves through. Mm, sway a little bit, stretch maybe, might have been a lot. <sighs> With your own body making space, making space to receive. And taking a collective deep breath. Lots of gratitude, lots of power, 
to Mamadi, to Nicole, to Crystal, to Shruti, to all of you, to Joao, to Sophia for holding space for us, to you, for you all, for your listening, for your attention, for your being, for your presence, and for food that gathered us here today. Thank you, thank you, thank you.